Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hey there, friend. My name's Sarai, and I host a spooky, casual podcast called Freaky AF, where I tell you stories of conspiracies, true crime, and of the supernatural. So if that's your kind of shiz, come check us out. I'm sure we'll be great friends. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, and a bunch of other places. Or you can look us up on Twitter and Instagram, where Freaky AF Pod, that's F R E A K Y A F P O D. Come get spooked, y'all. Hey, this is my disclaimer. If you don't like swear words, don't listen. If you don't like hearing about murder and other such violent crimes, hello, this is a true crime podcast. You took a wrong turn somewhere. If you're wearing a little red baseball cap that says M-A-G-A, get the fuck out of here. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ, and I can't tell you how nice it's been that I've received some very sweet DMs lately. I love connecting with listeners. Find me on the socials, Facebook at Beyond the Rainbow Podcast, and just about everywhere else as Rainbow Crimes. I have a Patreon account, which I'll link in the show notes. Why? Because I freaking sparkle! And Patreon is a great way to support the show and get a shout-out and a unicorn named in your honor. At the end of each month, we hop on our unicorns and take a ride while I tell my patrons about a case I haven't presented before. In fact, I have a new patron! Welcome, Jamie Y., my latest Rainbow Warrior to sign up for the fun. I have chosen a beautiful sky blue sparkly mare unicorn named Whisper for you, Jamie Y. You rock. Thank you. I've had several comments posted about the last case of Brandon Woodruff. As a matter of fact, the consensus is Brandon's innocent. And as Jamie Y. also reminds me, knives at crime scenes get slippery and the knife user almost always gets cuts on their hands. Where were Brandon's cuts from using a knife on his parents if he did indeed kill his parents? Some have even said they think the other kid, Mike Etherington, did have a hand in the murder of Brandon's parents. Your views are very interesting to me. Keep them coming. And don't forget, the Pacific Northwest True Crime Festival is coming up in October. Or maybe you're even going to be visiting the Seattle area that weekend. If you are, be sure to get your ticket soon. Use my code RAINBOW15 to get 15% off your tickets. The venue is the Green River Conference and Event Center in Auburn, Washington. Murder Murder News Podcast and I will also be holding a happy hour meetup event Saturday, October 8th. And I'll disclose the details of that the closer we get to the event. So it's going to be two events in one. Woo! Early next month, I'm going to have two ticket giveaways for the Pacific Northwest True Crime Festival. So be sure you're listening to find out how to win tickets. I think I'll do it via Instagram and Twitter. Maybe Facebook. I'm a Libra. Decisions are hard. With that, Let's get into this episode's case. Just after midnight on February 2nd, 2006, a stranger walked into Puzzles, a popular gay bar in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He looked like an average Joe. He was white, a little chubby maybe, stocky, a full face for sure. His brown hair was cropped close to his head. He had facial hair, almost like what the Amish wear, no mustache, but a little bit longer sideburns, and a really short beard. His eyebrows were bushy, and his eyes were dark, cold, 
with the right eye drooping lazily a little lower than his left eye. He wore dark pants and a black hoodie. The 18-year-old was named Jacob Robita. Flashing his fake ID, he ordered a Captain Morgan rum on the rocks. He threw the drink back quickly and he ordered another. He asked the bartender if he was in a gay club. The bartender affirmed the question and added that not just gays frequent the bar. He also told Jacob there was a lesbian bar up the street. Jacob quietly said, Nope, this is the one I want. And he walked away from the bar. Jacob took his second drink with him and he walked back to a pool table where two men were playing. Once he was near the pool table, he stopped, tossed back his second drink, and pushed down one of the men playing pool. He then removed a hatchet he had hidden under his hoodie, and he swung it at the man he had just pushed down. The hatchet made contact with the man's skin, injuring him. Another man grabbed a pool stick, and he tried to hit Jacob with it, but Jacob grabbed the stick and he hit the man with it. Another customer tried to grab and subdue Jacob, but then he felt the hatchet hit his cheek, and his warm blood started to flow from the wound. The hatchet fell to the ground in the scuffle. A couple of other customers knocked Jacob to the ground. Jacob hit his head, but he got up and he pulled out a handgun. He fired a shot into the air. He then pointed the gun towards the ground and he shot the man who tried to subdue him. He shot the man in his shoulder, missing the man's spine by just inches. Jacob then turned the gun and he shot a 23-year-old mentally challenged man who was there with his mother. The 23-year-old had been shot in his front and it went out the back. He fell to the ground and he tried to crawl to his mother before he passed out. The bar became a chaotic frenzy. Customers were trying to flee the bar with the bartender helping them. And that's when the bartender felt a gun against his head. Jacob was standing with the gun against the bartender's temple. He pulled the trigger and the gun went click. Not sure if he was out of bullets or if the gun just jammed. A confused Jacob ran out of the door of the bar and he disappeared. While three of at least a dozen men in the bar that night were hurt, amazingly, no one had died from their injuries. Witnesses were able to provide a description of the car Jacob sped off in. It was a dark green Pontiac AM. They gave the license plate number on the car and noted it had a Kentucky plate. With this information, police were able to identify Jacob pretty quickly. The following day, police raided Jacob's mom's house. There was an APB out on Jacob for three counts of attempted murder from the bar he attacked. His mom had told the police that she last saw him in the middle of the night, and he was bleeding from his head. He gathered a few of his things, and he took off again. Police entered Jacob's bedroom. Nazi posters covered his walls. Anti-Semitic and anti-LGBTQ writings and paraphernalia, all of that was found as well. The 18-year-old kept a trove of Third Reich memorabilia, books about the Third Reich and the Holocaust, swastika flags and other Nazi symbols. He had a sword and he had notebooks filled with racist notes and symbols. And he had a copy of the Turner Diaries. The Turner Diaries is a neo-Nazi race war novel that's continued to inspire domestic terrorists, including the Oklahoma City bombers. Police also found a note that Jacob had left for his mother, stating he was sorry for all the trouble he caused her, but he had to go out by his own means. Police began to worry that too much time now had lapsed since Jacob was on the run. They thought he could be out of state by now. So they put out a nationwide all-points bulletin on Jacob Robita. They also reached out to Jacob's father, and they asked him to make a plea to his son to turn himself in. But Jacob's dad refused, saying he was just too emotionally upset to do such a thing. And I have a question for you. At what point do you put some of the blame for a kid's actions on the parents?
Jacob lived with his mom. His room was a shrine to neo-Nazism and the hatred for people of color, also anti-Semitism and anti-LGBTQ. Jacob wasn't just a quirky kid trying to find himself. Jacob was lathered up in hate, and instead of seeking help for this kid, his folks ignored the angst with, Oh, well, he'll figure it out someday. And as for the dad being too damn upset to talk to his son on television? Dude, your emotional state isn't the priority at the moment. Finding your violent son is. I truly believe that too many parents just close their eyes to their children's actions. And that's how we end up with Jacob Robita's. After leaving his mother's house, Jacob stopped at a hospital in New Jersey. He wanted to get his bleeding head checked out. He told the staff there he was homeless and he gave him a fake name. The staff treated his head and then Jacob left. After seeing Jacob's story on the news, the hospital staff called police to report that they had just treated him for a gash on his head. Jacob then went to West Virginia. He went directly to an apartment complex that he had lived in for a year with his ex-girlfriend, 33-year-old Jennifer Bailey. Jennifer was on disability after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. The two had met online, and they spent weeks building a relationship before meeting. Jacob had then dropped out of high school in December of 2003 at the age of 16, and he showed up on Jennifer's door. He was ready to move in with her. Not to be judgy, but Jennifer was in her 30s and Jacob was still a 16-year-old child. I don't know, maybe we'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps she wasn't aware of his real age. I just don't know. But when Jacob showed up to the apartment they shared after he left the New Jersey hospital, he found out Jennifer no longer lived there. A neighbor told him where she now lived, and then the neighbor took him to her new place. It was about 13 miles away. When they got there, the neighbor asked if Jacob could stay the night with her, and Jennifer said no. So the neighbor drove Jacob back to the original apartments, and Jacob stayed at the neighbor's that night. The next morning, he drove to Jennifer's new apartment. It's not clear if Jennifer went willingly with Jacob or if she was forced into going. But she did drop her four-year-old child off with her mother, stating she'd be back for the four-year-old by midnight. Her other two children were with their father. It was recorded that Jennifer then stopped with Jacob and withdrew $500 from her bank account at an ATM. Police, armed with a search warrant, went to Jennifer's apartment. They seized Jennifer's computer, and they took a look at it. It showed that Jennifer was aware of the media surrounding Jacob's attack on the gay bar. After she had read what he had done, she even called a friend, and she told that friend that she was afraid Jacob was on his way to her place, and she didn't want anything more to do with Jacob. She sure as hell didn't want him hiding out in her apartment. But yet, when he showed up, she went with him. Again, it's not known if it was under duress or not. The two then drove to Jennifer's father's home. And this is where Jacob broke in and he took some guns. He stole a rifle, a shotgun, and ammunition before getting on the road again. It was determined by law enforcement Jacob must have had prior knowledge that Jennifer's dad kept guns and ammunition on his property. On top of the nationwide bulletins to other state law enforcements, police in Massachusetts enlisted the help of the FBI in pursuing Jacob. Flyers and news coverage regarding who Jacob was and his crimes were blasted all over, as well as information about his ex-girlfriend Jennifer Bailey. It seemed like Massachusetts police actually knew what they were doing in these circumstances. Although no one had been murdered by Jacob yet, they knew he had the potential to kill. Two days after the Puzzles Bar attack, the afternoon of February 4, 2006, 
Jacob and Jennifer were pulled over in a restaurant parking lot for a routine traffic stop in Gasville, Arkansas. 63-year-old officer Jim Sell approached Jacob's car. The officer spoke with Jacob for probably about 30 seconds. That's when Jacob pulled out a 9mm Ruger handgun, a relic of Nazi Germany, and he shot Officer Sell dead as he examined Jacob's ID. Jacob then tore out of the parking lot and he was on the run again. It wasn't long before Officer Sell's body was found and an even more heated manhunt was on. Arkansas State Troopers started to pick up on Jacob's trail and they gave chase. That chase turned into a high-speed pursuit. A roadblock was set up ahead after about eight miles into the pursuit. Jacob was able to maneuver strategically around that roadblock and again flee officers. Several more miles up the road, police tried another move, and they placed a tack strip in Jacob's path. By now, the high-speed chase had gone on for just over 16 miles. As Jacob's tires were deflating rapidly, eventually Jacob lost control of the car. In what my head imagines looked like something from an action movie, police cars were lined up, cops were in ready positions with their weapons drawn, aimed at Jacob's car. When his car came to a complete stop, Jacob was seen hugging Jennifer. Then he put his 9 millimeter pistol up to her head, and he shot her, killing her instantly. Arkansas police heard the gunshot, and they made the assumption they were being fired upon and released over 60 rounds at Jacob's car. Somewhere in the middle of the 60 rounds, another 9 millimeter gunshot came from Jacob's gun. He had shot himself in the head. When there was no more movement coming from Jacob's car, the police approached. Jacob was still alive. He was transported via life flight helicopter a hundred miles away to a hospital in Springfield, Missouri. It was at that hospital he would later die. There were many weapons found in Jacob's car, as well as bags of convenience store foods and two bags of clothing. One of the bags of clothing belonged to Jacob and the other to Jennifer. Jennifer having a bag of clothing did convince some she had went with Jacob willingly. But again, Jacob had weapons. He could have threatened her or the lives of her children if she didn't comply. Did she have missed opportunities to escape Jacob if she was being held captive? Maybe. We don't know for sure. Maybe she thought she could talk him down from this violent state. Unfortunately, we'll never know what was going on in the minds of Jacob and Jennifer in those early days of February 2006. Jacob's grandmother said he was never quite the same after Jennifer broke up with him. After the breakup, three friends of his were made to go fetch him from her apartment in West Virginia and then they brought him back to his mom's home in Massachusetts. His grandma said he just seemed so much darker in mood after that happened. Which kind of makes me wonder, when did Jacob get into this neo-Nazi crap? Had he always had an inclination for it? Or was it something that transpired after his breakup with Jennifer? Hey, Rainbow Warriors! I've mentioned a couple times this incredible drink I found, and it's been helping me through many of my hard-to-focus days. It's called Magic Mind, and I seriously love it. It gives me the boost I need to get through my hours of researching and writing, not to mention recording and editing. Best of all, Magic Mind is made from all natural ingredients. No more of those tall cans of drinks claiming to boost my energy but giving me the jitters instead. It's recommended to drink Magic Mind in the morning for daily productivity, but I'm usually pretty productive in the morning anyway. I've noticed about 2 or 3 in the afternoon I start to really drag. My brain is foggy and I get super sleepy. 
and I still have so much more I have to do. So I've been drinking my Magic Mind Little Green Shot in these lull periods that I hit, and it perks me right up. It allows me to complete projects that would normally sit until after my nap, or till the next day when I got around to it. Magic Mind contains Bacopa Moniera. That's a nootropic that improves your attention span, your ability to process and learn new information, and your memory. It's everything I need in order to put together episodes for Beyond the Rainbow podcast. So if you're like me and you need to get shit done and kick ass while you're doing it, you just gotta try Magic Mind. I have a 20% off code to share with you guys. It's Rainbow, R-A-I-N-B-O-W. To use it, you can go to magicmind.co backslash rainbow and enter the code rainbow at checkout. The best part is they have a money back guarantee. And the folks at Magic Mind like me so much, they're giving you, my listeners, an extra perk. If you get the subscription, it's a 40% off. My 40% off code only lasts 10 days, so get on that. I have a little rant for my true crime quickie this episode. There's something I'd like to address. It's something that I read that's really been bothering me in the states of Idaho and Montana. As we know, both of them are very highly conservative states. And yes, CJ is going to get a wee bit political again. But it has to be said because I felt horrible for the guy it's happening to. It seems a man by the name of Randall Mangies, who is now 48 years old, has this black cloud hovering over him. When he was 18 years old, he was accused of being a sexual offender, and it's been on his record ever since. 18, the designated age we legally become adults here in America. We can move out from under our parents' care. We don't need our parents' signature anymore to do things, like to our bodies, a tattoo maybe. And it's usually the age where we are graduating from high school and thinking about our next steps as adults. Sexually at 18, we're no longer considered jailbait. But if you think about it, you're still a teenager. Many are still very immature and naive. And if we look at it from a sexual identity aspect, some are even trying to figure out what their sexual identity is and how they fit into the world around them. In 1993, at the age of 18, Randall was employed on a ranch in Idaho. The ranch had a foster youth program. It was here he met two 16-year-old boys, and the three of them engaged in consensual sexual acts. And I know some of you might say, they were 16. There was nothing consensual about the encounter. But really, is a 16-year-old much different than an 18-year-old? I guess it depends on the person and how mature they are. Maybe I'm jaded, but to me, 18 and 16 doesn't seem to be too crazy out of the realm of acceptable sexual partner ages. I'm old enough to wish kids would wait to have sex until they are at least 18 and in love, but I'm young enough to know that hardly ever happens. The real problem in the situation came from ancient anti-LGBTQ laws in Idaho where the ranch was located. Because he was involved in a homosexual encounter, and because he was 18, all adult and legal and shit, Hell broke loose for Randall. Even though all parties involved were considered of legal age to consent to sex by Idaho and Montana laws, as long as the sexual partners were of opposite sex. Maybe an 18-year-old girl did two 16-year-old boys. Perfectly fine. But because it was three same-sex boys, and oral copulation and anal penetration took place with the three young men, Randall was arrested and went to trial for what was called a crime against nature. His jurors then found him guilty, 
and Randall served seven years in prison for his sins against the Bible. You can't fucking tell me government and religion don't mix together when they're not supposed to, especially when it comes to American citizens' private body parts. And the reason I brought Montana into this? When Randall was released from prison, he moved to Montana, and he was required to register as a sex offender. Even if he would have stayed in Idaho, he still would have been required to register. After his release from prison, every year well into his 40s, Randall has been required to register as a sex offender. Just because he had one evening of consensual sex capades with two other boys. Because of this sex offender registry, Randall has been plagued almost his whole life with not being able to find adequate housing or jobs. No one wants to rent or employ a registered sex offender. And still, even less people will stop and listen to the actual circumstances around his conviction. The United States District Court of Montana finally heard three of Randall's pleas for appeal, and they granted him a safety net so he no longer has to register as a sex offender. But fucking get this! As of this year, Attorney General of Montana, a Republican named Austin Knudsen, he is fighting the District Court of Montana's ruling in favor of Randall. Knudsen is screaming anti-LGBTQ so loudly, watch this fucker end up in a gay scandal himself. The continued persecution of Randall, based solely on his sexual orientation, can be seen as a personal attack on LGBTQ people in the state of Montana. Thankfully, Randall has the ACLU and Lambda fighting for him. Randall, we hope unicorn justice will prevail and that this black cloud of LGBTQ prejudice will dissipate. And if you live in Montana, don't vote for Austin Newton again. He is shady as fuck. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. Remember, it's not a crime, not even in Idaho or Montana, to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>